Okay, this is a Kasparov game in the early part of his career against Sun Ayito, played in 1981 in the Graz tournament. Kasparov was playing black. Uh, Sun Ayito played knight f3, a solid starting move. Kasparov just played symmetrically, symmetrically with knight f6, and after c4 he played c5. Now after knight c3 he played e6, and he's aiming in this game for what is known as the Tarash defence, uh, which accepts an isolated queen's pawn, as we'll see. In this move sequence, after bishop b5, bishop d6, suddenly you two, he plays d takes c5, so black's got this structural weakness now, the d5 uh, pawn. But uh, black has active pieces. If you look at this position after bishop g4, black's pieces are all quite active. This bishop's quite a nice uh, pin at the moment. And if black could potentially liberate this pawn, maybe, later to dissolve this pawn, it wouldn't be so bad. Um, Sonia Nito continues uh, playing logically with bishop b2 and rook c1 now. Bishop d6. So, all of a sudden, this bishop's pointing at white's king. Um, this pawn is not immune because of bishop takes h2 at the end of it. If knight d5, knight d, queen d, queen, bishop takes h2. Um, Sonia Nito, he plays bishop e2 now. So would you be worried as black here with this isolated pawn? Well, first Kasparov plays bishop b8, because he now has to protect this um, pawn soon. After knight b5, Sonia Nito is preparing the classic blockade on the d-pawn. Kasparov now, he plays knight e4, so he's lunging his pieces forward against white's king. White continues this blockade strategy. So this is a classic example of, of playing on both sides of this isolated pawn. Um, White's got a very secure position it seems at the moment and this bishop's also very nice on this diagonal supporting the blockade. White's rook lo looks very nice so White looks to have a pleasant position. Black also looks to have a very active and pleasant position except for this you know potential liability here. So what does he play here? First he plays rook e8 so he's over protecting this knight on e4. Now White plays h3 so, is Kasparov going to retreat or does he take on f3? He actually chooses to take on f3, so he's undermining slightly the blockade. And now he plays queen d6, setting up what could be regarded as a little bit of a sort of cheap attack, well, you know, cheap pressure just, just to mate white if the knight moves. But it is positional in, in that um, it is getting black's pieces more menacingly on white's king as well. So it's kind of positional attacking. And black does have to sort of compensate for this structural weakness. White plays queen d3, and now Kasparov plays knight g5. Obviously the knight's immune. Sonia Nito continues casually just to put more pressure on the d5 pawn, though. He doesn't actually mind about knight takes and queen h2 check. Um, Kasparov actually plays rook cd8. Let's have a quick look why this wasn't scary for white. Knight takes, bishop takes, queen h2, king f1. And White's king is, is quite safe here. And these bishops are very nasty. Um, this pawn is still a terrible liability. And in fact, this pawn's a goner. So this would be a hopeless position for black, with, with white getting a, a clear advantage. So Kasparov has to be very careful here. He's dancing a bit on thin ice. So he plays C, rook cd8 here. And white plays now king f1, prophylactically um, avoiding the tempo gain black would gain from a, a check. Uh, now knight e4 again. a3, so potentially this is going to start undermining black's control of these two squares, if b4 and b5. So is Kasparov getting positionally outplayed here? He plays a6, then queen c2, now bishop a7. So this bishop's being rerouted here. Are there potentially now tactics of knight, knight takes f2 uh, to simulate like Fischer's brilliancy prize or, or something like that? Sonia Nito plays bishop d3, and now we see queen e7. So it's interesting, this, this pawn is just lurking there as a continual weakness, and Kasparov is just doing some subtle manoeuvring. Now rook d6, a very aggressive move, swinging the rook in on the king's side. All of a sudden, we see now that um, may, maybe this is starting to swing in black's favour, because, you know, uh, if black can start getting this attack going, then... 
the isolated pawn's not going to be a big deal. But first, Gasparov, he carries on overprotecting the knight on e4. One more move. Instead of, say, rook h6 or rook g6. So that's quite interesting. Now b5. So white pursues this idea of undermining black's control of these dark squares. If he can, like, take this um, piece, then these dark squares will be strengthened. h6. Rook cd1. So again, the pressure is re-exerted on the isolated pawn. And we have now some some exchanges of, of pressure attacking and defending this pawn. a4 now. Bishop c5. Now here, Kasparov plays an interesting plan. He solidifies the c-file now by playing b6. Um, like here. So now he's um, preparing for the c-file pressure, but is this d-pawn in trouble? We'll see now. King g1, knight e7. Where is this knight going? What has Kasparov achieved over the last few, mo few moves? I mean, first of all, he's now got his bishop on c5, cementing the c-file with, with the b6, reinforcing that. But also, this rook's now free to swing to g6, and this knight appears to be swinging in for the attack as well. Uh, and this is what happens now. These pieces start going in, plunging in for the attack. But after this, Sonia Nito plays a slightly controversial idea now coming up. After knight h4, you see black's pieces are menacingly now coming to the white king position. But Sonia Nito, he plays knight e6 now, um, which is like forcing black to swap the queen for two rooks. Now, normally this wouldn't be too dangerous, but black has got slightly misplaced pieces here on the king side. So, was Kasparov worried here? Um, suddenly he plays knight f4, which is also a very nice place for the knight. So, you know, these two pieces are not really um, positionally well oriented, it would seem. But after king g1, we see here knight f3 check and king f1. And, and what is black doing? Now here, um, Kasparov comes up with an absolute brilliancy, and this is why he liked this game from the early part of the career, his career. Can you spot the move Kasparov plays next? I'll give you five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. He plays bishop, takes e3. It's difficult even for my analytical assistant to spot this move. It needs quite a lot of um, time to find this. So after f takes e, he plays now rook d takes g2, believe it or not, because the idea is that he's vacated that d2 square for this check, which would win back the queen with material advantage. Um, and also, he's now threatening this mating combination, um, you know, rook g1s and rook h2s uh, with rook g1, so it's very dangerous for the white king. Sonia Nito, he plays queen c3. So Kasparov plays rook h2 now with menacing mating threats. And after knight e2, he casually just plays king h7 here, believe it or not. And white is defenseless here. Absolutely defenseless. White tried queen c8, and after rook h1 check, king f2, Kasparov now finished with knight d2, simply threatening rook f1 mating, to which white would have to give up material with, say, queen c1 to stay with the mate. So here, San Junito resigned. So this was one of the early brilliant games from Kasparov career, played in 1981. Excellently played, and a fine demonstration of the isolated pawn and the compensation you can get from, from, from it.